Hello, Pastor Ryan here. As we come uh, to day seven, Lord's Day seven of the Heidelberg Catechism, and we have four questions uh, for us today uh, as we uh, continue to talk about our deliverance. Not only do we continue to talk about our deliverance uh, from sin and the results of sin, of death, uh, but we uh, begin at the very end of the fourth uh, question that we have today, which is uh, question uh, 23 overall and really 22 and 23. We get an introduction uh, to the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed and the content of the Creed uh, makes up the bulk of the Heidelberg Catechism, and in particular, the middle section of the Catechism. So let's get started today, Lord's Day 7, uh, as we begin with question 20 of the Catechism. Are all men or all people then saved by Christ, just as they perished through Adam? The answer comes, no, only those are saved who, by a true faith, are grafted into Christ and accept all his benefits. Now, this question does not uh, mean to pretend or to get to the fact or to ask a question about if there is salvation apart from Christ. Um, the Christian belief is that there is no salvation apart from Christ. Uh, but this question is getting at, uh, we are all lost in Adam because we are all descendants of Adam. We are all uh, totally depraved or as the Anglican uh, verse or a version would say, the phrase, um, from the Articles of Confession, uh, which the Methodists also receive through Wesley, that we are inclined toward evil, and that continually. So how are we saved? We're saved by Christ, but not all will be saved by Christ. There is not a, a universal salvation. We are saved uh, if we have true faith, if true faith has been given to us. So what is true faith? That's what the 21st question asks. What is true faith? And the answer in the catechism comes, true faith is a sure knowledge whereby I accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. At the same time, it is a firm confidence that not only to others, but also to myself, who God, God has granted forgiveness of sins everlasting righteousness and salvation out of mere grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. This faith, the Holy Spirit, works in my heart by the gospel. In other words, our salvation, this faith that we have, this belief, comes when we have an assurance and a knowledge of what God has revealed to us in his word. It doesn't just mean that that we believe intellectually it to be true, but we appropriate that truth to our lives and we begin to live by it. Not only do we have an intellectual or knowledge, intellectual and heart knowledge of what God's word says to us, but it is for us a confidence. When Wesley in in the room at, at, at Asbury, at, not at Asbury, at Aldersgate Street, as he felt his heart strangely warmed and felt that he had an assurance of faith, what he was describing there was the, the knowledge that the confidence that we have of our salvation is not born in our own ability to believe. It's not born in our own ability to follow or to, to do a certain amount or set practice of things or to avoid certain other actions. But we have a confidence that that our salvation is granted, that we have forgiveness of sins, not based on our merit, but based on God's grace given to us that is rooted in the merits of Christ. It is what Christ has done for us. Our salvation is what we receive. It is not what we achieve. I love the words of Dallas Willard, who says that grace is never opposed to work. We should never believe that God does not call us to do good deeds. He does. Scripture is, is woven through with things that we are called to do or to not do, that, that God has prepared even in advance good works for us to do. But us doing those works is not the way by which we receive salvation, but we do those things because we have received salvation. Grace is not opposed to work, but grace is always a opposed to earning, Dallas Willard says. We do not earn our salvation. Salvation is granted to us based on Christ's merit. 
The 22nd question then is this, what then must a Christian believe? And this now gets into the heart of when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about what it means to be a Christian, what are the parameters? What are the, the basic things that someone must believe in order to say they're a Christian? Now, we have to be very clear on this point that, that Christians in various different traditions or denominations have different beliefs on different doctrines. And so we oftentimes in the church have debates about various doctrines and how we understand those doctrines and how we apply those doctrines to our lives. But when it comes to the very rudimentary things, the very basic level of what is core doctrine, the things necessary for belief, that's what this catechism wants to get at and talk to. What then must a Christian believe? The answer comes, all that is promised us in the gospel which the articles of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith teach us in a summary. Now, we need to be clear here that the word Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic, which we understand generally, uh, us as Protestants understand as one denomination among many. Uh, there are three major branches, we could say, of Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which, of course, is global, the Eastern Orthodox churches, which would include uh, state-type uh, uh, Orthodox churches, um, like the Greek Orthodox Church or the Russian Orthodox Church or the Armenian Orthodox Church um, or the Antiochian Orthodox Church. But all of those churches together combined as Eastern Orthodoxy, as we would generally think of it. And then the Western Protestant churches, Presbyterians and Lutherans and Methodists and Anglicans, all of those um, who Baptists would be included in that as well. And so, so the term here, Catholic, when we talk about what our Catholic faith is, it means our universal faith. All of the main major branches of Christianity would hold to the Apostles' Creed, or if they don't hold to the Apostles' Creed because they would say they're non-creedal, that their only creed is the Bible, they would certainly agree that, that the, the concepts here in the Apostles' Creed, serve as a summary of what the total gospel is. And so we believe what God has promised us in the gospel, in the good news, through Scripture, has been revealed to us. And the Apostles' Creed stands then as a summary to talk about these core doctrines of which we believe. So the 23rd question, the last question that we have for us today, is what are these articles? And the answer is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in a holy Catholic Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now, when we talk about the Apostles' Creed, we are not here thinking that this summary will include all of the doctrines upon which we would confess as Christians or that we might believe in particular uh, about uh, as particular denominations. For instance, and I'll just take this one, I believe in the Holy Catholic Christian Church. We're all members of churches that have different ecclesial authorities that are organized either as congregations or Episcopal, meaning they're, that there are bishops or that there's presbyteries. Um, there are all uh, types, if you're Lutheran, there would be a synod, uh, would be the term of, of, of churches that are bound together, but there would be no bishops. In a Roman Catholic church, obviously there are bishops and archbishops and a pope. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, there are bishops and archbishops bishops as well. And so, so we're talking here about, about the core doctrine of what the very basis of that belief is. What does it mean? And so the Apostles' Creed has stood for centuries to serve as this summation of our faith. And the next few weeks as we go through the Lord's Day, we will be looking at, at various passages. We'll be breaking down uh, the various phrases of these components and parts 
of the Apostles' Creed. But I invite you today, if you've not done so, to go ahead and download the Catechism. If you've just stumbled upon uh, these recordings for the first time, to go back and to listen to the other uh, the other um, weeks and teachings that we've done, the first seven or first six uh, Lord's Day's teachings that we've been through. And I also invite you to, on a regular basis, to, to pray this prayer of confession. Uh, every week, uh, Monday through Friday, uh, here at United Protestant Church, we've been sending out an order for evening prayer. Um, and as we do that, one of the components of that order of evening prayer, which comes from uh, the, the Episcopalian uh, Book of Common Prayer uh, from the 1920s, uh, it, we include the Apostles' Creed. We say that together. We say these words together. They're translated slightly differently, but they are essentially the same. But I would invite you on a, on a daily basis to begin to recite the Apostles' Creed, to remind yourself of what you believe. And even if you don't believe some of these things or you struggle with them or you wrestle with them, for you to rehearse and to say them aloud, to recite these things, to ponder them in your heart and to ask God as we go through um, this catechism and as you recite the Apostles' Creed, for him to give you clarity and vision and insight into what it means to believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. And so uh, as we normally do, we once again uh, conclude today by going back to Lord's Day 1 and the first question, that overarching question, which helps us, I believe, always to apply uh, the catechism to our lives and to our hearts. Oftentimes we can get caught in uh, up in the intellectual unpacking of what it means to believe or the unpacking of the catechism uh, such that it becomes an intellectual game that is removed from our lives and from our hearts. So the first question still remains to us, what is your only comfort in life and death? Again, in these days that are difficult for us, we all need daily reminding, moment by moment reminding of where our comfort lies, where our hope is. And the answer comes to us that I'm not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He has set me free from all the power of the devil and also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. And again, if you would like to receive uh, not only uh, the updates of uh, the catechism, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism through our, our emails, uh, but also our order for evening uh, prayer, Monday through Friday, and other emails that we send out, including the order for Sunday service, uh, you can simply email me, seniorpastor at upcgl.org, and, and we can get you hooked up, uh, signed up for those emails. God bless.